Welcome to Conversations with the Authors. Welcome back to Conversations with the Authors. I'm your host, Daniel. I'm Daryl. I'm Sandra. And with me are my parents and the authors of the highly rated fantasy novel, How Nicholas Became Santa Claus. And today, we're going to have, well, a conversation. Prior to the release of your book, when you were developing the book, um, was your what was your experience like with with beta readers, and that is to say, readers who got their eyes on your manuscript before you went to publishing? And how did you uh, incorporate their feedback? I know for me, I, I did a lot of writing away from home and at home, but when I was away from home, I had some of my my work colleagues look at it. And uh, when they had a break and uh, see what they thought of it, so they would read it and I'd get feedback that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same here, and then we talk about it over surgery and it would be talking about characters and what they would be doing and what they should be doing or not doing, or if they liked it or not liked it. How did that? How did that early feedback uh, affect uh, your final draft? Well, you know, for me, I wanted to find out what really caught people's eye and imagination. So sometimes they would make suggestions, and some of those suggestions I took, uh, and uh, other ones gave me ideas for other things. But I would make changes sometimes. And how did you, Sandy or Daryl, I mean, depending on which one wants to answer, how did you decide, because I'm sure all feedback is valuable uh but that feedback which is sort of supercilious that, that sort of you know you're giving me feedback that doesn't necessarily you know help me in this process how did you sort of determine or was was there silly feedback was it all informative was it all uh, useful no some <laughs> a lot of it was useful some of it was just curious <laughs> so <laughs> i you know i put that in a in a box and set it aside in my head how did writing nicholas how nicholas became santa claus affect uh, your writing process as a whole moving forward from nicholas or reflecting back on your other works your sci-fi and it gave us a good foundation of how we work together Mm -hmm. because when he needs something more emotional he'll go to me, or if he needs something very imaginative, he'll go to me. If I need something more grammatical or, or outlined... Which, which makes me wonder, um, uh, you're a man, <laughs> dead, and I'm, yeah. Sandy, you're a woman, um, I hope so, so. It, it makes me, th- speaking of that point, writing female characters, writing male characters, did you sort of did you did you bounce ideas off each other, or did you just say, "Here, because this is a guy, I need you to write this part," or "This is a woman, I need you to write this part"? When did you decide maybe I need more of a uh, of a male or female's perspective in writing this particular character? You know, I think that if being a writer, uh, you have to employ your imagination, and for me, it's even more challenging when I write a female character. Mm-hmm. Oddly enough, a lot of my characters and, and other things that I've, I've written are female. Uh, so it, it's a challenge for me to think and, and get into that skin. So, um, and it's, it's, uh, it, it triggers your imagination. There are some things that I would ask her, but generally I use, I use my imagination. In most cases, I just based it on the men that I liked and or disliked and mm-hmm. If it was a villain, I went for all the characters that I didn't like in the man. And if it was a female, uh, a female, I looked for the things that I was trying to soften the man with. And there are so many different characters and creatures in this book. What is the process uh, for you for creating unique cultures and traditions for Nicholas? Now, we talked about creating a realistic world before, but I mean... You know, you're developing you know, light sprites. You're developing gnomes. You're developing whispers. Mm-hmm. You're developing whispers. How did you create unique cultures and sort of philosophies for these 
beings in your book. And how do you do that for your sci-fi and romance and whatever else might have these sort of well, you know, beings? First, I, I think it has to do with the character's purpose. And so we wanted their any culture that they had to lend itself uh, toward furthering the story. And so we would sit down and we'd talk about what they could do, what they could not do, what might be interesting for this, this, the culture of this, this, uh, these beings. And uh, then we'd decide uh, the way we're going to write it if the story needed that. Sandy, do you have any um, input on this? It was pretty much the same. You know, we would also try... I, I wanted every character to reflect some human city right. culture so, so whatever you borrowed from so because if if the oddling can't be friendly to the human the, fr mm. the human certainly is not going to be friendly to the oddling and they're definitely not going to work together so uh, for those of you dear listeners who are are hopefully listening uh, this is an unscripted uh, podcast. Uh, you may have been able to tell this from uh, before. So if you hear uh, rustling in the background, perhaps some jingling and <laughs> jangling, that would be my tiny, fluffy German Shepherd who is listening to the podcast. But um, She likes the dog parts. She likes the dog parts. Those are her favorite parts. <laughs> <laughs> she she feels she's she snuck in to listen. Right. And she says she relates to those most of most of all. <laughs> Her uh, name is Penny. Uh, and and speaking of relating uh, to characters, how did you develop, um, you know, your main character Nicholas, uh, and how did you infuse him with personality and backstory uh, to create a compelling character? And I asked this, and it sounds like I'm echoing a previous question, but. Uh, I think when it comes to writing, really having an idea of how you're going to establish a main character, whether it's a protagonist or an antagonist or it's a contagonist, you know, this guy who sort of tries to get in the way of everything, I think it's important. I think it's an important note. So what is your thinking on that? Well, I think uh, I, I use myself uh, some of the I ideas uh of what it's like to be a child since I used mm. to be one. All yeah. adults I know <laughs> have been one. Right. Yeah. So I reach back and I, I reach back and and see how I reacted to things and how my friends reacted to things. Right. And I kind of incorporated that. And then she did the same thing and we kind mm -hmm. of mashed that together so that we could have a complete character. You know, he was very curious and uh, he was knowledgeable about things and other things he, he knew nothing about. And so... We wanted to, uh, you know, fill the story up with, with that type of reality. Oh, yeah. And I think that um, and we've got a preview of the prologue and we've heard some of the chapters in the reading uh, at some of the beginning of our episodes here. And I think that uh, you really did a, a great job of uh, sort of bringing to life what this young and teenage Nicholas is going through, particularly uh, when you find someone who uh, who uh, uh, you know, sort of fancy, and, and vice versa, characters that sort of uh, might echo that reaction. I think uh, I think it's been well written. Um, so, as writers, how did you approach creating uh, tension and conflict uh, in your storytelling with Nicholas? Well, we wanted to make sure that we illustrated uh, what the protagonist wanted, what the antagonist wanted. And make it clear to the to the reader that there's going to be a conflict. Right. Without conflict, you don't have a story. So, uh, and our our subplots and our our main plots had to uh, be comprised of those uh, very important issues too, as well. So, and did you, uh, Sandy? Did you chart this sort of thing out? Did you you know write out uh, this is where he's coming? That this who is? This is where he's coming. This is where he's going. This is what he wants. This is what he doesn't like. Did you write essentially like a dossier? And when it comes to other stories like sci-fi, romance, drama, uh, are you, do we develop the characters the same way? Do you find that works, or does it seem to be different depending on the genre you're writing? Well, we use we used a lot of outlining, and each character had an outline. We used a program called Dramatic, Dramatica Pro. Pro that helped us to guide where our outline fill-in was 
was appropriate or inappropriate. But I, I you know, even before that, it's 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 a good idea to list the characters that you right. want to uh, have in the story, and you give them a full background. Mm-hmm. You might not utilize all of that information right. in the story, but you might, but you have it to draw from because you might want to harken back on that or hint at right. And I hear, I hear. And not even necessarily for the current story, but you might want to put it in a, a, a story in the future or maybe in a flashback that you know is in another you know periphery. Or right. Something like, right. The, we I have hand sketches and photographs mm-hmm. uh, with notes on the back. For Nicholas, for all the other characters, for uh, Juno's... um, And that's an interesting thought, uh, photos and characters. Now, the Oscars, the Oscars just happened, and Mm -hmm. there were some amazing wins, some wins that I was really happy about. Um, And, uh, you know, Brendan Fraser won, um, uh, Michelle Yeoh. Do, do you think about Oscar winners? Do you think about celebrities? Oh, a lot of well, times yeah, we, you know, uh, we write with a character in I mind mean, you, that might play this I mean, character. Even ChatGP, ChatGTP, this you know fancy Van Dangle chatbot is out there, and there are these different AI-generated art you know, um, programs. Uh, do you use those to sort of visualize what your characters might look like? I understand well, that they use ma- prompts and descriptions. Ma- actually, I don't, and... Uh, I, I think when I'm writing, I usually put uh, in mind either an actor or an actress, ah, and yes, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I I think I get a feel for their personality right. and what they might and might not do, right. and it may coalesce with the character that I'm building. Right. So if I keep that in mind, it helps me to keep consistency. Mm. Right. Okay. Uh, so that my the personality of my character remains. Uh, throughout the story. So when you're reflecting on celebrity, for instance, um, I'm thinking uh, up to chapter four, at least we we, ha- we have Nicholas's father Thomas. I envision Brendan Fraser as I, I mentioned agree. before, because I think he's got such this sort of kindly personality. Mm-hmm. Uh, while he's strong, I think he's he's I don't think he's he's foreboding in turn. So no, I think and I think he's an empathetic he, character. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. So, he has the proper set of emotions for the working with the oddlings and the humans. So with that in mind, without doing it without any spoilers, what sort of celebrities let's say you're shooting a movie. Let's say you've got Steven Spielberg on board, let's say you're shooting over at Netflix or you're over on HBO or what have you. Uh, and you're going to make a movie, and they ask you, who do you want to play, dot, dot, dot. So what character do you have in mind to well, play? Well, you know, if, if, if I were actor? thinking of, of, about the villain in my character, who you will find out who that is uh-huh. as you read, you know, I, I think uh, I've got the character of maybe like uh, like a James McAvoy, for instance. Ah, uh-huh. yes, yes, You know, yes. and I, I think he'd, he'd fit that character well. When you read the story, you, you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. Of course, you might have another idea. And if we were actually making a movie, you know, that would only be a suggestion because the, the producer, director, or any of those folk are going to, you know, have the last say. They're going to have the last uh, 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 say in who, who that's going to be. Right, um, right, so, right. Mm-hmm. There, there's a, a character that goes through and has a whole lot of power in the story, mm-hmm. and that's Zorna. Mm-hmm. And I think Idris Elba would be perfect for him. Aha, uh-huh, okay. Nice, yeah, nice, nice strong, powerful, and, yeah, and yeah. we've seen him in powerful roles, so we know that he can do that. And he can also be gentle, right? right. And right. Soft, and so and I think there are also some very strong female roles that can be played in this uh, book as well. Oh um, yeah, and mm-hmm. there are so many. I mean, there are so many talented new actresses. Uh, for instance, I think Jenna Ortega would be great for one of the roles, maybe as Princess Sarah, who we see in Chapter Four. Uh, which we read about uh, 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 last uh, episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the producers and it's going to be up to the readers who are, you know, traveling through this book because they'll make up, because they'll make up their own minds. That's right. That's right. Nothing nothing makes a recorder better than uh, (laughs) an air freshener going off in the middle of the It sounds like a sneeze, doesn't it? It really (laughs) adds an extra oomph to the... (laughs) I was like, oh, this mm-hmm. is not... Yeah, no, okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the characters receive word that Zeely is burning villages. We mm-hmm. heard this from the whispers. Correct. And he's taking food from the young stock. And 
how do you approach writing darker scenes like this in your book? I mean, this is you know loosely a holiday story. I mean, this is about Santa Claus. So how did how do you? Well, you know, you, 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 you darker I, elements. I don't want I don't about. want to get the impression like we said before. This is not one of the those uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed right, Reindeer Santa exactly. Claus. This this is an adventure. Uh, science. As I, you know, as we said, he's fiction. burning. He's burning yeah. villages. It's, he's he's yeah. taking food. It's, it's a lot of magic in this. This. So, <clears throat> the, the the bad guys, for instance, are easy to write, and my wife wrote those. But in my my impression, and she can follow up with this, is that all you have to do is let your inhibitions go. Because we all have inhibitions and we hold back. There are things we won't do, things we won't say, and we were trained, we were enculturated not to do those things. But when you write a bad guy, a villain, you just have to just cut that wire. Right. And I'll tell you, a lot of actors will tell you that it's more fun to play the bad guy. But you wrote the, which I don't want to mention his name, but you you did write the. The principal bad guy in there. Oh, Suffice yeah. to say, the, the kindest woman I know wrote some of the darkest you know, scenes. Yeah, uh, but well, some of my, my most favorite. Holding all of that back. My, my favorite <laughs> villain creators mm -hmm. was Outer Limits, mm -hmm. Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock. So when I needed a character, I would say, hmm. And who are some of your influences when it comes to writing or movies? Um, did, and, and how does that play a part in, in what you, in, or how you write? I think, I think... Uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, um, uh, Stephen King, you know, <laughs> writers like, how does that, how do they sort of play... Uh, well, you know, p uh, persons like that are inspiring. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, you don't, you don't, you're not copying them, right, but right. you're being inspired by yeah. them, you know, to search around, especially for the bad guy, to search around those dark corners in your mind and right. see if you can pull that stuff out. It's back there, believe me. Everybody has that. You know, I think when uh, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote the, uh, 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 the story about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he was talking about human beings having that dark and light side, right. and he was able to pull that out. And so... Uh, as an author, it must have been very satisfying for him to be able to get that on uh, on paper. And for us, we do the same. And speaking of imagination, um, the book cover uh, is a, it's a, extremely imaginative and creative with the wizard on the cover and the dragon in the background. Why was this third edition, this new cover through Ewing's publishing, why was the reimagining of the cover so important to you, and how does that? How do you think that's helping to sort of push the story, or well, the or, original like cover market, or the original cover, I did mm -hmm. from a photo that I took, and but it didn't get across the electricity in the book. Right, you don't it feel did, it. Sort it of didn't conveyed. get. It didn't get the. It didn't get the magic. It didn't get the the fight for all of the people. Right, and this, of yeah, course, I, I, I think the cover now kind of reflects what's inside the book, right. too. And this, of and course, wasn't a critique <clears throat> that was given to you by anyone. I think this is just your personal feelings on how you wanted to sort of push the story across. No, You know, when you go shopping, you know, you can have all kinds of, you can have boxes of cereal on a shelf. And they can be all in gray boxes, but you have that one that's in that red and blue, and it's got it's got fireworks coming off the cover. That's the one you want to look at. So I think it was fairer to the book, and even to the reader, I think, to be able to get a hint of what's inside just by seeing, by actually judging the book by its cover. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, again, it's so imaginative and creative. And inspiring, uh, as before I said, the uh, composer to our intro, Alexander Nakarada. Uh, it, it's imaginative in this book. If you really, if you want to see this magic and you want to be inspired, you can pick up the book at troopbooks.com. That's C R O U P E. You can check out their Facebook at Troop Books. You can check out the Instagram and the TikTok at Troop Books. 
And if you have any questions for the podcast or suggestions, maybe suggestions for actors and actresses who would play your favorite character in the movie, who is your favorite character, please let us know. We'd love to answer you. And if you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. Let us know and we'll talk to you next time on Conversations with the Authors. Thank you.